Hi, I'm Ken Currington. I'm one of the surgical educators here at Camels, and today I'm going to demonstrate to you the proper use of the nasopharyngeal airway as an adjunct in the airway management of a patient in the acute setting. This is a standard nasopharyngeal airway. It's made out of rubber, it has an angulated end, and a trumpet at the proximal most end. These come in different sizes, so the first thing we have to do is make sure we have the appropriate size for the patient. The idea here is we have a patient who, while he's in the supine position being resuscitated, has sonorous breathing, indicating that the soft tissues of his tongue have fallen against his posterior oral pharynx and obstructed his airway. This is usually characterized by that sonorous breathing, either spontaneously or if we're using an ambu bag. So you'll hear suggesting the tongue is partially obstructing the airway. This is designed to go into the nose and all the way around posterior to the tongue and get beyond the point at which the, point, the tongue is falling against the, soft, or the oral pharynx, allowing the patient to be ventilated. The patient can be either awake, semi-conscious, or unconscious if these are used. Most patients tolerate having some, a tube in their nose fairly well, even in the conscious state. So, we want to size first, since we want to get around the back of the tongue. It's very important that this be long enough. This is sized by putting the trumpet at the nares and then making sure the annulated end reaches the tragus of the ear. And you can see this is the exact perfect size for this mannequin. A mistake would be to turn it this way. That's not the way the tube is going to go in, so we put it in the way it will be oriented once it's in the patient. Now, I like to lubricate these. Usually I'll have a mound of lubricating jelly here, and I will take the tube and rub it into the jelly and make sure it's smeared all on the outside. A mistake would be to take it and dip it into the mound and have a glop of lubricating jelly now obstructing your airway. So, outside lubrication, I'll even take my small finger and use it to lubricate the nares and the proximal nasopharynx. Now, the nasopharynx is directed straight posteriorly. We tend to think, because of the shape of the nose, that the nasopharynx goes up and around in a curve. It's actually a horizontal passageway that goes straight back, so it's critical that the airway be inserted directly posteriorly. I augment my ability to do that by pulling up a, slightly on the tip of the nose. You can see how that opens up the nares and forms virtually a tunnel straight back. This is lubricated. I always hold the tube about halfway back. If you hold it too far back, then you lose control of the tube. If you hold it too close, you take too long to advance. So halfway back, nares open, and then I just advance a couple of centimeters at a time. It should go completely without resistance all the way to the trumpet. If you meet resistance, as in all things that we Insert in body cavities, stop, reassess. You may have a deviated septum and have to go to the other side. Once this is in, if the patient is breathing spontaneously, we would hope to hear non-sonorous breathing. If we were having to ambu before, we can still ambu with this in. It does not inhibit our ability to create a tight seal. And we can breathe the patient through the nasopharyngeal airway without difficulty. So, nasopharyngeal adjunct airway in the acute set. Okay, now we're going to talk about oral pharyngeal airway. These are oral pharyngeal airways. You can see these are made out of a much stiffer plastic. They are non-malleable. They have a peculiar question mark shape. They are designed to end up inside the patient in this orientation. And again, the idea is now we're going to insert an airway that goes through the mouth, the end of which will go posterior to the soft tissues of the tongue and open up that obstructed passageway. This, because we're putting it in the mouth, can only be done in the unconscious patient. I usually consider this a prelude to intubation, so I would not want this put in me. If I'm awake, I have a terrible gag reflex and I would simply vomit or expel it forcefully 
and be right back into the difficult position of not being able to breathe. So, unconscious patient, proper sizing, because we're going into the mouth, we start at the corner of the mouth, and the tube should reach the angle of the mandible. Remember, ramus, body, angle. You can see that this tube is actually a little big. Now, I can still use this, but it would be a little difficult to put in because it's large. What I don't want to do is use a tube that's too small or an airway that's too small because it won't get posterior to the tongue and lift up the soft tissues to maintain an airway. So let's try this one. You can see that's much better. A mistake would be to have this upside down. Now let's talk about how to open the mouth of a patient who is unconscious. The first inclination is to take our fingers get into the ridges, the gingival ridges above and below the incisors and push like this. And you can see in this mannequin, I can't open that, but it puts tremendous stress across the top of my fingers and on my extensor tendons. And it limits how hard I can really push because I'm only so strong in extension. I'm much stronger in flexion. The other risk of doing this particular procedure is that I push on the soft tissues, I tear the gums or the frenulum and cause bleeding. So the correct way to do this is to employ the snap finger technique. If we snap our fingers, usually we're using our middle finger and our thumb. Snap, the <coughs> middle finger drops below the thumb. That's the correct final orientation. If we keep that final orientation and now take our middle finger and put it on the incisors, remember the patient's unconscious, on the incisors, the upper incisors, and then the thumb on the lower incisors. We now have a mechanical advantage created with flexion that allows me to open any patient's mouth. It's much more comfortable, I'm much more powerful, and I can open the mouth much wider. This is the correct technique. A mistake would be to cross your fingers in some kind of odd orientation because you like to snap your fingers differently. Let's snap them in the usual way and open the patient's mouth. Now we have the airway. We've chosen this as the correct size. If we try to, in the adult, put this airway in in the orientation in which it's going to end up finally, you can see the tendency is for the airway to rub against the tongue, grab the back of the tongue, and simply push the tongue further posteriorly, further obstructing the airway. These are put in by actually directing the tip of the airway against the hard palate, rotating the airway in away from the midline so that we don't catch the soft tissues of the soft palate or the back of the tongue and leave it in the correct orientation. So, snap finger, end of the airway against the hard palate, advance, rotate away from the midline, drop it in. The phalanges will end up against the lips. And you can see that again, the patient can easily be ventilated around this area. Correct insertion of an oral pharyngeal airway in the acute setting. All right.